The Aldabra rail is a flightless bird that came back from extinction. They evolved from flying, white-throated rails, who landed on the Aldabra Atoll a hundred thousand years ago, eventually evolving into their flightless selves, until they were swallowed like the rest of the island by rising waters. But then, scientists found the very extinct flightless birds not very extinct at all. Upon further investigation, this wasn't the same lineage of rails, it was a new one. Also evolved from the same white-throated rails on the same island of Aldabra with the same bone structure and evolved flightlessness. Seemingly, the same species had evolved again. A case of iterative evolution, the only time this has ever been recorded. But what are the chances of this happening? And can this actually be considered the same species as the previously extinct one? Also, if animals can come back from extinction, then can humans make that happen more quickly? Well, I'm gonna be answering all of that, so let's get into it. To understand what exactly happened with the Aldabra rail, we first have to understand one of my favorite concepts, convergent evolution. It's when animals evolve similar traits independently, usually because they both face similar selective pressures and come up with similar solutions. Bats and birds are the classic example of this. Both animals adapted their limbs into wings that powered flight, but it's not like they were both inspired by the pterodactyls, they just adapted the feature on their own. The birds and the bees, I mean the bats, most common ancestor would have been a terrestrial tetrapod, so they both would have had to develop flight individually from there. Confirming this fact is the difference in their wing construction. While birds essentially have long forearms that have feathers reaching down to build the rest of the wing, bats have elongated fingers with a membrane stretched across them and connecting to the legs. You can kind of see how bat wings and our hands come from the same structure. These traits being homologous in function but analogous in structure shows how their evolutionary history came to a similar trait in different ways. It's like Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace, both coming up with a theory of natural selection at the same time independently, the only difference being that we actually acknowledge bats. Another great example is the Philly Roe, a rare open water sea slug that looks, swims, and hunts like a fish. They didn't evolve from a fish-like ancestor, they evolved from the same things that evolved into the typical sea slug, and became fish-like on their own. Maybe it was just an efficient design for swimming, and so the Philly Roe naturally adapted into the shape. Natural selection doesn't ask if it can copy your homework, it just follows the best solution it can come up with that can be inherited. Convergent evolution happens in subtle ways all around the animal kingdom, because animals face similar selective pressures all around the world. It's also a very fun topic to think about. For instance, take us, the smartest organisms that we know of. We've changed the very environment that we live in so much that our modern world looks nothing like our ancestral one. But what would it take for a life form evolving on another planet to do the same thing? Would they require similar tactile grabby things to form their tools and technologies? Would they need to develop a central nervous system for thinking? Would they need language and culture, emotions and intelligence in order to get as far as we have? Who knows? I mean, we don't have the first clue about what aliens look like, unless these ones are real, but this is definitely something to question, so let me know what you think. In a sense, you can say that the Aldabra rail is just a case of convergent evolution of flightlessness. It just happened to occur to the same species on the same atoll, creating the same result, just at different points in history. So if this is a case of repetition and not resurrection, would that mean that it's not the same species and instead just a very similar one? Well, that depends on how you define a species, which actually does not have an agreed upon definition in science. So I'm gonna analyze this situation with the three most popular species concepts. The morphological species concept, where animals that have the same physical traits are of the same species. In the case of different species that look the same, this would include the subtlest of differences, and some also extend this concept to include things like diets and behaviors. So some scientists took the bones of the extinct Aldabra rails and compared them with the new ones, and they found that they were basically the same. So by this metric, the new Aldabra rail is the same species as the old one. The biological species concept, where a species is a group of interbreeding natural population that is reproductively isolated from other groups. So basically, if they can make babies together, and that's something that they would normally do in nature, they can be considered the same species. Both Aldabra rails are actually subspecies of the white-throated rail, so they actually would probably be genetically close enough to reproduce. And while this doesn't regularly happen, 
you know, with one population being dead and all, they do live on the same island, so I think if they came across each other, they would reproduce, and I think this would imply that they would be the same species. The evolutionary species concept, where an evolutionary species is a lineage evolving separately from others with its own unitary evolutionary role and tendencies. This has a lot of overlap with the phylogenetic species concept, so for this video I'm gonna consider them the same thing, but basically the phylogenetic tree. The historical lines of ancestry would determine whether things were the same species or not. This is confusing because both Aldabra rails should actually have the same exact phylogenetic tree. They're just offset by a hundred thousand years or so. But if you included time and looked at it like this, you would probably say that they aren't the same species since they come from different lineages and should thus have their own branches on the phylogenetic tree. Now all these species concepts have support but also have criticisms. They all have certain shortcomings that make it hard to agree on which one is best to use. Also, evolution is a messy, gradual thing. Some people are against the idea of species entirely, since they're just our arbitrary way of categorizing things to make it simpler. It doesn't actually reflect the complexity of life. But the phylogenetic species concept is the most popular as far as I'm aware, as its main fault is just the fact that it's hard to tell what things are phylogenetically related, especially for extinct species. So I'm gonna go with that one for this video, feel free to disagree. Also, I mentioned earlier that Aldabra rails are actually a subspecies of the white-throated rail, so technically they are the same species, but I think that species concepts should apply to this particular discussion of these subspecies. But this makes the two Aldabra rails not the same species, and it also makes extinction a permanent thing, since it just means the end of your phylogeny. But humans often break the rules of nature, and in many cases have addressed the subject of extinction. We actively try to prevent it in endangered animals, so it would only be right that we have tried to bring back species from extinction. Two, resurrection biology, also known as de-extinction or species revivalism, is a process of generating an organism that resembles or is an extinct species. There are a few ways this can be theoretically done. First is through cloning. There have been several attempts to clone extinct animals, and while we've seen cloning work with animals that are still around, the genetic material of extinct ones aren't the most available, and so their creations aren't very viable either. The most successful attempt though, though, was in the Pyrenean Ibex, which went extinct in the year 2000. The last member of their species, named Celia, died to a falling tree. But in a year before her death, scientists had harvested tissues from her ear. They transferred the nuclei from her cells into the closely related domestic goats to act as a surrogate mother. And out of the 285 reconstructed embryos, none of them survived the pregnancy process, all of them dying before coming to term. All except for one, who was actually born alive. It was a cloned female and survived for several minutes before dying from defective lungs. This was the first animal to ever become unextinct, despite surviving for a few minutes. Another way scientists have tried to unextinct an animal is through genome editing. You may have heard of CRISPR, a system that may allow us to make edits to genetic material. And though most people are interested to see if they can genetically engineer their kid to look like Brad Pitt, or whoever else is good, I don't really know about celebrities, others want to use it for reviving dead species. Because maybe, by editing the germ cells of a closely related species, you could create an offspring that more so resembled the closely related extinct one. This also runs into the issue of not having enough well-preserved material, because you kinda need to know what genetic changes to make in order to create the extinct species, and if it's even possible. The final method would be selectively breeding living species into becoming their closely related extinct ones. This is called backbreeding, since you're trying to breed a lineage backwards into a previously ancestral state. This requires that living animals have characteristics of their extinct one remaining in the population. And so if you artificially select the right traits, you can get an animal that is phenotypically the same as the extinct species, but it wouldn't have the same genotype or genetic identity. It would just be a current animal bred to look like the old one. So besides these three methods, there's not much else humans can do, at least not that we know of. I guess we could try to create environmental pressures in order to induce iterative evolution, but I imagine there are just too many variables to control 
control and we would probably mess that up. As far as we know today, bringing species back is quote unquote possible, but it'll never have the exact same genetic identity. And so whether or not that constitutes actually bringing the species back is up to your own definitions. Who knows though, maybe we keep collecting genetic material of endangered animals, and when they do go extinct, we actually figure out a way to recreate them. It's definitely not what most scientists are focused on though, so it'll probably be a long time before the field of species revivalism sees much progress. Now when I brought this channel back from extinction, I had no idea that people would enjoy these videos. But over 2,000 people convergently evolved and hit the subscribe button, meaning it's probably a pretty adaptive thing to do. I'm super grateful for this community that has been built so far. You guys mean the world to me. Thank you so much for over a thousand subscribers. On to the next video.